Let's see. Uh, some of you have heard Horatio, you've heard of Horatio Spafford. Some of you haven't. Horatio Spafford was a prominent Chicago lawyer and recent supporter of D.L. Moody. Remember, we've talked about D.L. Moody before, and so we're talking about the last quarter, 1800s, you know, so like 1875, 1900-ish, around in there. Uh, Horatio and Anna, that's his wife, Horatio and Anna's only son was killed by scarlet fever at the age of four, in 1870. In 1871, his real estate holdings on Lake Michigan were wiped out by the Great Chicago Fire. In 1873, he sent his wife and four daughters ahead for a vacation in England. But on November 2nd, 1873, two boats, one with Anna and the girls, collided killing all four daughters. Anna was saved alone. As he sailed out to meet his wife, the captain alerted them that this was the spot of the accident, at which Horatio retired to his stateroom and wrote the lyrics to the song, It Is Well With My Soul. Can you imagine this? 1870, you lose your four-year-old. A year later, all of your real estate, everything that you probably had <laughs> was your money, gone, wiped out by the fire. Two years after that, four daughters taken in a boat, uh, in a collision in the um, Atlantic Ocean. And as he passes over the place where it happened, he wrote this, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. In the chorus, it is well with my soul, it is well with my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul. Love that hymn. Love the story behind it. Hate what he had to go through to produce it. But the other person who could have written this song tonight is Habakkuk. He does not start out here, but he's going to get here. And so God is going to... Um, he and God, Habakkuk and God, are going to have a little bit of a conversation about what God is doing in the world. <laughs> and um, he, God is going to clarify a few things to and for Habakkuk. And at the end of Habakkuk, we have one of the greatest little segments, little poems of faith that you'll read in the entire scripture. So we're going to look tonight at Habakkuk, who will get to, by, cha by chapter 3, he will get to, it is well with my soul. We're walking our way through all of the books of history and the prophets, minor and major. We're kind of right here, right now, if you can, if I'm not standing in your way, we're right about here. We're going to get back to Jeremiah next week, but Habakkuk fits in right here because right here there are some things happening in the world that are mm, confusing to Habakkuk. And so he wants to talk to God about those confusing things. Habakkuk was a prophet who knew tragedy, but he also is going to respond in faith. So lest you think this guy had a, you know, was flown to heaven in a, in a bed of roses, it's not the case. But he exercises faith anyway. And so I've put the word faith uh, on the book of Habakkuk. Uh, 
The righteous will live by their faith. That shows up in the New Testament several times. Here's where it comes from. The basics, who? Habakkuk is his name. It, it means kind of embrace. Um, some people, in the sense of embrace, it can mean, um, well, he, he gets an oracle, which is a burden. And so he's, he's got to sort of embrace the burden. And so his name kind of reflects that. He's writing in the pre-exilic period, 612 to 586. He's primarily writing to Judah and to Jerusalem. And my Old Testament professor, uh, Charles Charlie Dyer, said, Habakkuk wrote to show how the righteous should live by faith in unsettling times. Hmm. 612 B.C. or 2024 A.D. Almost 3,000 years. Same God, same lessons are going to apply today as they did then. The times, Babylon, remember the up-and-coming superpower... The, remember, they've already visited Jerusalem when Hezekiah was getting better. And they came up and they said, hey, we're the Babylonians. <laughs> and Hezekiah said, let me show you my wealth and let me show you my weapons. And they went, oh, <laughs> thanks so much. And they wrote that down and off they go. Well, Assyria at that time was the superpower. In 612, Babylon deals Nineveh, so Assyria, a fatal blow, effectively bringing Assyria to an end in 612. Who would have thunk it? No one. But in 612, Babylon has just defeated, it's sort of like, um, what is that? I know it's not staged at all. The wrestling, you know? And you're wrestling for the, <laughs> the big belt. <laughs> And whoever's got the belt is the champ, and whoever wants the belt has to defeat the champ to get the belt. Babylon steps in the ring and says, I'll take that belt, and they deal Assyria a, a fatal blow in 612. Josiah's reign and spiritual reforms have come to an untimely end with his death on the battlefield at Megiddo, against Egypt. Egypt was going up to help uh, help Assyria because I, they were allies. I, this is still a great mystery about Josiah. He did so many things so well that he decided that he should stop Egypt from helping Assyria and so he does that and he dies. He, he shouldn't have done it but he did it. So he dies in 609 B.C. on the battlefield at Megiddo, which you might be standing one day when we're able to return to Israel. Uh, you might be able to stand on Har, Megiddo, the mountain of Megiddo, not like a rocky mountain, <laughs> but a mountain nonetheless in their terminology. So Har, Megiddo. Hmm. It should be firing off bells for you. So he, Josiah dies on the plain of Megiddo fighting the Egyptians. Well, the Egyptians continue to go north. And Babylon then crushes Egypt. <laughs> Egypt should have stopped. They didn't stop. They get up to Carchemish which is uh, north of Israel, uh, and they are defeated, uh, they are crushed by Babylon in 605. This is what is happening in the world. In these seven years, Babylon is now undisputed champion of the world. Josiah, a great reforming king, is dead on the battlefield at Megiddo. So Judah is going, uh-oh, <laughs> this is not so good. And Babylon has also crushed Egypt. 
in the whole process. So there is really no one who can stop Babylon anymore. They are going to, their empire is going to grow and grow and take over everything. And one of the things they're thinking is, hey, remember that other king, that Hezekiah guy? He showed us his wealth and his weapons. Well, their current king is dead. So you know where we should go? Let's go to Jerusalem. And so in 605, they go to Jerusalem, and that's where, as we saw last time in Jeremiah, they take Daniel and his buddies and probably some other of the intelligentsia, younger people, and their goal to deport them to Babylon, they're in the first wave, is to turn them into Babylonians. So when you read the book of Daniel, and Daniel's going, ah, can't we eat our own food? And so this whole thing with Daniel begins, but it's because he's basically been mm, kidnapped by the Babylonians in 605. All of this stuff is happening. Whew, a lot going on. So Jehoiakim, one of Josiah's sons, I know, this is like a soap opera. Jehoiakim, one of Josiah's sons, has been wickedly ruling Judah undoing everything Josiah had set in motion. So Josiah dies on the battlefield at Megiddo. Jehoiakim says, what's all this reform stuff? <laughs> Come on, let's have a good time. And so he reintroduces idol worship and everything, and it just is horrific. So he begins taking Judah down. Zephaniah, Jeremiah, and now Habakkuk, God has sent to beg and warn Judah one more time to repent. One more time. And so God appeals to them. The false prophets are saying otherwise. The false prophets say, we should fight Babylon. We will win. Jeremiah is walking around saying, give up. Surrender unconditionally now. If you don't, you're going to die. What are they doing with Jeremiah? Throwing him in jail, throwing him in mud pits. They're, they're trying to get rid of Jeremiah because he's not giving them good news. So Zephaniah, Jeremiah, and Habakkuk are begging, warning Judah, do not do this. Judah's good life is about to come to an end. It's 605 B.C., and Babylon is coming. And they are unstoppable. So the bottom line for tonight. The godly live by revelation, not explanation. The godly live by revelation, not explanation. So God is going to reveal to Habakkuk uh, what's really going on. And so Habakkuk starts off his book. This is the message that the prophet Habakkuk received in a vision. And this is the message, this is the burden. The burden that Habakkuk has to carry is this message from the Lord. And he says, how long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Violence is everywhere, I cry, but you do not come to save. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Why must I watch all this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I'm surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. The law has become paralyzed and there is no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous so that justice has become perverted. And the Lord says, ah, oh, gee, yeah, you're right. Man, that one got away from me. <laughs> Didn't see that one coming. <laughs> Whoa, I must have taken too long of a nap. And the Lord replied, look around at the nations, look and be amazed. For I am doing something in your own day something you wouldn't believe even if someone told you about it. 
I'm raising up the Babylonians, a cruel and violent people. They will march across the world and conquer other lands. They are notorious for their cruelty and do whatever they like. Their horses are swifter than cheetahs and fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their charioteers charge from far away like eagles. They swoop down to devour their prey. On they come, all bent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind, sweeping captives ahead of them like sand. They scoff at kings and princes and scorn all their fortresses. They simply pile ramps of earth against the walls and capture them. They sweep past like the wind and are gone. But they are deeply guilty, for their own strength is their God. And Habakkuk says, oh, I understand now. Yeah. Habakkuk's first complaint is, Lord, you aren't doing anything. Look around. The times are unjust, wicked, and dangerous. I'm praying for revival. You're not answering my prayers. In fact, you seem silent, indifferent, and inactive. God answers. I am working. I am working. You never would have thought about what I'm going to do. I am working. So now, Habakkuk, <laughs> when I'm complaining, and my complaint is, God, you're not working, and God says, I am working. So then Habakkuk says, Oh, Lord, my God, my Holy One, you who are eternal, surely you do not plan to wipe us out. Oh, Lord, our rock, you have sent these Babylonians to correct us, to punish us for our many sins. But you are pure and cannot stand the sight of evil. Will you wink at their treachery? Would you be silent while the wicked swallow up people more righteous than they? And he goes on, he talks about fish being caught in nets, and then will you let them get away with this forever? Are they going to succeed? And Habakkuk says, chapter 2, verse 1, I will climb up to my watchtower and stand at my guard post. There I will wait to see what the Lord says and how he will answer my complaint. Probably not such a great idea, but this is what he does. Lord, I've laid out my case expertly, and I'm just now going to climb up here and wait, because surely you are not going to use the Babylonians against us. You, you can't. And the Lord then gives him, through the rest of chapter 2, um, <laughs> some thoughts on those things. And so Habakkuk starts his complaining again with, you can't use the Babylonians against us. Don't you remember? The Babylonians are wicked. Though we, your people, surely need to be chastened. Should it be by those godless and ruthless people? Are you just going to let them get away with it? I'll just wait here for your answer. I love the honesty with which we can go to God. <laughs> Um, Habakkuk is <laughs> um, kind of walking the line here. <laughs> but he says, I'm just going to wait here for your answer. And so here's how God answers him. He says, write down this vision. It's for the future. Though it may seem long in coming, it will come. Write my answer plainly on tablets. This vision is for a future time. It describes the end, and it will be fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, wait patiently, for it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. Then he says in 4 and 5, Look at the proud. They trust in themselves and their lives are crooked. But the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. 
Wealth is treacherous, and the arrogant are never at rest. They open their mouths as wide as the grave, and like death they are never satisfied. In their greed they have gathered up many nations and swallowed many people. So God says, write down this vision. In other words, I'm not. God says, write it down. Hold me to it. It's coming. I'm not afraid for you to write this down. Write it down. Second thing he tells them is trust my word. There are two ways to wait. The arrogant Babylonians trust themselves. They're puffed up. The righteous, however, must live by faith. So he says, write down this vision. Trust my word. And then in 6 through the end of the chapter, he talks about the judgment that is coming. And so he, a a little bit, uh, comforts Habakkuk. Um, He says, soon their captives will taunt them. They will mock them, saying, what sorrow awaits you, thieves? Now you get what you deserve. And so the tables are going to turn on the Babylonians. And he talks about all these different things that are going to happen to to the Babylonians. So he says, announce my judgment. And he pronounces a woe against extortion and a woe against security by unjust gain. And he says, woe against exploiting people. And there's another woe against drunkenness and violence and a woe against idolatry. So the Lord is heaping up woe upon woe upon woe. And the Babylonians are, um, everybody is shouting for attention. Everybody is raising their voice. Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. And he ends this chapter. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. The Lord doesn't raise his voice. The Lord doesn't shout back. He just says, let all the earth be silent. I'm in my temple. I'm on my throne. I got this. Let all the earth be silent. Watch me. Habakkuk has started complaining God has answered his complaints and told him eventually those who are um, the the Babylonians, it's going to reverse on them and they will be judged for what they're doing. Habakkuk, this is the wisest part about what Habakkuk does in chapter 3. Habakkuk worships God. This prayer was sung by the prophet Habakkuk. So it's, it's worship, but he's, it's a song prayer. It's kind of like a psalm in that sense. He says it's kind of the same thing Job said. I have heard all about you, Lord. I am filled with awe by your amazing works in this time of our deep need. Help us again as you did in years gone by. And in your anger, remember mercy. I see God moving across the deserts from Edom, the Holy One coming from Mount Paran. His brilliant splendor fills the heavens and the earth is filled with his praise. His coming is as brilliant as the sunrise. Rays of light flash from his hands where his awesome power is hidden. Pestilence marches before him. Plague follows close behind. When he stops the earth shakes. When he looks, the nations tremble. He shatters the everlasting mountains, and he levels the eternal hills. He is the eternal one. I see the people of Kushan in distress, and the nation of Midian trembling in terror. Was it in anger, Lord, that you struck the rivers and parted the sea? Were you displeased with them? No, you were sending your chariots of salvation. You brandished your bow and your quiver of arrows. You split open the earth with flowing rivers. The mountains watched and trembled. Onward swept the raging waters. The mighty deep cried out, lifting its hands to the Lord. 
The sun and moon stood still in the sky as your brilliant arrows flew and your glittering spear flashed. You marched across the land in anger and trampled the nations in your fury. You went out to rescue your chosen people, to save your anointed ones. You crushed the heads of the wicked and stripped their bones from head to toe. With his own weapons, you destroyed the chief of those who rushed out like a whirlwind, thinking Israel would be easy prey. You trampled the sea with your horses and the mighty waters piled high. I trembled inside when I heard this. My lips quivered with fear. My legs gave way beneath me and I shook in terror. I will wait quietly for the coming day when disaster will strike the people who invade us. Even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, able to tread upon the heights. Has any circumstance for Habakkuk changed? You say, well, no, but yes, he's heard from God. He's heard from God. And he has been shown something that's coming to reverse the fortunes of Judah and Babylon. So he prays to God. His view of the Lord and his ways has been inspiring and refreshing to his soul. He meditates on God in 3 through 15 mighty acts that God has done in the past. And he praises God, declares his renewed intent to wait in faith in spite of his circumstances and undoubtedly shares this message with the faithful to encourage them. What has Habakkuk received that he didn't have before? He's heard from God. Circumstances really haven't changed. Babylon is still coming. And where is Habakkuk going to go? Babylon. Does he deserve to go there? Maybe not as you and I see it, but he's going to Babylon. God says, I want you to be able to encourage my people. Even in Babylon, encourage them. I have not forgotten them. I will come and get them. And so Habakkuk finishes this little book worshiping God. The godly live by revelation, not explanation. They live by revelation, not just the book, revelation, but they live by revelation not by explanation. Same was true with Job. Job never got an answer to why. He had to live by revelation. God said, if I can do all these things, can't I take care of your problems? Answer, yes, yes I can. Habakkuk, you don't think I can use the Babylonians to execute my judgment against my people and then come back and get the Babylonians? No, Lord, I don't think that's you. Well, it is. I want you to live by revelation, Habakkuk, not explanation, because I cannot give you a full explanation. But you can live by revelation. Some observations. Why do good and godly people suffer? Why isn't God answering my prayers? Why does God seem silent 
and inactive when I'm praying for and according to his will? Why does it seem that every time I'm genuinely striving to do my best for the Lord, I only get the worst from other people? Answer, the godly live by revelation, not by explanation. Why do good and godly people suffer? I don't know. I have no explanation. But I have revelation. God is good and good all the time, and he knows what he's doing. It doesn't mean he's going to share it with me. <laughs> Who's been your counselor, O Lord? Who has advised your spirit? Has someone taught him what is right and just? No. He knows what he's doing. Does he share all the time? He does not. <laughs> you say, well, I wish he did. I'm not sure that I'm glad about that. <laughs> I'm not sure what I would do if I knew it was coming. <laughs> Why isn't God answering my prayer? I don't know. I know that he won't hear us if we continue in sin. He said, if, if you continue in sin, I'm not going to listen to you. So if you say, well, I don't think that's it, then I, I'm going to say, I don't know why I think God is listening. I don't know why he's not answering, or at least answering the way you would like him to answer. Again, he knows what he's doing. And even in these things, I, I read in almost all of chapter 3 here, just revisit who he is and what he's done. <laughs> been through much of the Old Testament. We've still got more to go. But we've been through much of the Old Testament. You've seen him again and again and again and again. And you say, but my situation and circumstances are different. No. The only way they're different is it's you instead of them. Why does God seem silent and inactive when I'm praying for and according to his will? I don't know. I don't know. Why does it seem that every time I'm genuinely striving to do my best for the Lord, I only get the worst from other people? I don't know. The godly live by revelation, not explanation. God has told me how I'm to treat people. That's how I need to treat people. I don't, I don't get other explanations for why this and why that and why the other thing. Well, those are observations. What promises did God make to Habakkuk? So as we pray in difficult circumstances and situations like, the, not like these, but like the ones we live in, what are God's promises? Because then we can say, Daddy, you said. You said. And if he says it, he means for us to hold him to his promise. Not like, <laughs> like that. But he said, if I make you a promise, come ask me about it. I'm good for it. What are some of the promises that God gave to Habakkuk? Chapter 1, verse 5. I am working. God has told Habakkuk in this situation he is working. God is working in every situation you and I are in tonight. Do I know how? I do not. Do I know when? I do not. Well, what if it doesn't turn out the way I want? I'm sorry. I, I don't know what to tell you. God has promised that whatever he does, he does for my good. Do I see it? Sometimes I don't until later. Doesn't God also say in the New Testament somewhere, all things work together for good? Are your circumstances and situations part of all things? Or are they outside of all? <laughs> I think all is somewhat inclusive. <laughs> God doesn't give Habakkuk an answer, but instead gives him a renewed vision of himself. 
We must walk by faith and not by sight. So when it seems like God isn't working, remember, he's promised he's working. I'm working. And Bill, I'm working in ways you cannot imagine. Do you, do you ever do that? I get to the point where I go, okay, it could be this, it could be this, it could be this. And you know what I've concluded after all these years of going, well, maybe it'll be A, maybe it'll be B, maybe it'll be C. You know what it always is? Z. It's something totally unexpected that I didn't even realize he could do. So now I ha it's a fun game. Well, it could be A, it could be B. Well, then I know for sure it's not going to be any one of those. <laughs> and I don't know what it's going to be. So what do I need to do? Wait. <laughs> and I need to wait in faith. He says to Habakkuk, I am working. And you can go to God and say, Daddy, I know you're working. I can trust you because you're good. And you have my best at heart. And so I know you're working. And reaffirm your faith in him and who he is and what he's done in your life. What other promises did he make to Habakkuk? He said in chapter 2, verse 4, the righteous shall live by faith. Romans 1, 17, there was one act of faith for justification. We've talked before, a great example is Galatians 3, 11. We need a lifestyle of faith for sanctification. He brought us into the family. He says, now I want to make you like my son. And so it's not about staying in the family. He's already finished that. You're in the family, and I'm not kicking you out. But I want you to become more like my son. And so we have to continue to walk in faith for our sanctification. Hebrews chapter 10. Remember when we went through the book of Hebrews? I know it was a long time ago, but we went through the book of Hebrews. And it was likely people in that day who were faced with very, very difficult trials and thought if we could go back, if we could pretend like we're Christians living under Judaism, that we will escape um, persecution or whatever. And so in chapter 10, all the way through the book, but in chapter 10, um, he continues, the author continues to remind the people, follow God, come what may. Follow God, come what may. Follow God, come what may. He tells Habakkuk, I'm working. He tells Habakkuk, the righteous shall live by faith. And he says, my glory will fill the earth in chapter 2, verse 14. The omnipotent God of heaven and earth will accomplish his will according to his inerrant word. You say, well, I've read the last chapter. God wins. True. <laughs> True. He does win. Sometimes we need to remind ourselves he wins. But what if I lose on the way? He wins. And if he wins, you are in Christ, you win. It may not work out. Life may not work out like you think it's going to work out. I know you know that. But sometimes we have to remind ourselves. We, we may have to lose for him to ultimately win. And that's okay. Because we don't really lose. All we lose out on is, well, I expected life to go this way, or this is my dream, or this is... And he says, no, the way I want you to glorify me is this. And if you'll do that, I will be glorified, and you will win, because I'll win. He says, my glory will fill the earth. Chapter 2, verse 20. He says, I am still on my throne. And he said, I'm in my holy temple. Let all the earth be silent. God is on his throne. He hasn't gotten off of it yet, and he won't. 
You say, but my circumstance and situation, maybe he, maybe he went to the store. Maybe he's attending to someone else and he doesn't have time for me. Do you understand who you are talking about? It cannot be. It cannot be. He has not lost track of you. He is still on his throne. And when he chooses, and I could even say if he chooses, he will do something about it. I don't know what, but he has said he will do something about it. He's still in control. Romans 11, 33 through 36 uh, is another great passage that reinforces that. I wrote a little note here to myself. Many times God's rewards require waiting. Many times. I think I might change that to every time. <laughs> every time God's rewards require waiting. And so at the end of these promises that he gives to Habakkuk, to me, he's saying, Habakkuk, let it be well with your soul. Let it be well with your soul. I know you don't love it, but we need to love it. The last few verses. I will wait quietly for the coming day when disaster will strike the people who invade us. Even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yet... I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. His circumstances when he's rejoicing and worshiping the Lord are pretty bad, pretty desperate. And yet, he can rejoice and worship God in the midst of these very, very, very troubling and difficult times. So in confusion and difficulty, hopefully one of the things we've been talking about through our whole uh, ongoing Old Testament class is get to know God better. Seek to know him. I love it that you want to know his word better, but I'm even happier if you get to know him better. Get to know him Seek to know God in confusion and difficulty. Seek to know God's word and his promises. Take your, promise, or take your problems to him. I would add with the respect and awe that are due him. With honesty. With an open heart. And open will. To wait. And then wait for his answer. Look at his revelation rather than looking for a satisfactory explanation. Focus on who, not why. And let what you find turn worry into worship. And once you feel like you've gotten an answer, and the answer may not be, Lord, should I turn left or right here? And he says, Bill, trust me. And your answer may be, Bill, trust me. I'll take care of you. I got this. But should I turn left or right? Bill, trust me. Just trust me. Trust me. When you feel like you get an answer, then step forward in renewed faith. Remember God's past provisions and mercies and with true the true peace of God not just a shallow optimism you have the you may have the peace of God which will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus 
when we pray and we trust. And in faith, let it be well with your soul. I wrote one other warning for myself um, at this point in the lesson. It's kind of finished. And what I can do in confusion and difficulty, again, I know it's not what any of you do, but it's what I do. Um, for me, in confusion and difficulty, uh, there's scheming territory up ahead. Scheming territory. I probably don't want to wait. And so if I can scheme, then I won't have to wait. And I don't really have to trust God. I can trust myself. Because isn't it in the Bible, he helps those who help themselves? <laughs> By the way, that's not in the Bible. <laughs> so often in times of confusion and difficulty, I can begin to think up schemes. Like we've talked about since Abraham. <laughs> I begin to think up schemes. And I just remind you as I remind myself, warning, <laughs> It's like lost in space. Danger, Will Robinson. <laughs> scheming territory ahead. When I'm in confusion and difficulty, scheming territory. And I have to say, oh, okay, what do I need to do here? I need to seek God. I need to wait for his answer. And then I need to step forward in the renewed faith of, of that, whatever he showed me. Maybe he showed me about himself. Then in faith, it can be well with my soul. For next week, Jeremiah 34 to 52, that finishes Jeremiah. That's only um, 18 short chapters. <laughs> Better than the 33 from the first part of Jeremiah. Um, sorry, no rest for the weary. You might as well start reading Ezekiel. Um, Ezekiel is coming. And Ezekiel is a little bit like eating sawdust. You'll kind of chew on it. Um, and then you'll want to spit it out because it's kind of dry. <laughs> so don't wait on Ezekiel. It's great stuff. Oh, my goodness, it's great stuff. But you've got to kind of chew your way through it. So next week, Jeremiah 34 to 52. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for reminding us of who you are through the prophet Habakkuk. Uh, he was facing some unbelievably difficult circumstances. Uh, Father, we look around today in 2024 and we see difficult circumstances. And so many times we don't know. Uh, we try to instruct you and we try to scheme and, and think this is how you should solve our problem, Lord. And what you ask us to do is to get to know you better. To get to know your word better. To wait for you to speak to us through your word. And then to walk forward in a renewed sense of faith and confidence in you. And then it can be well with our souls. Our Father, uh, in a room this size with this number of people, there are certainly uh, troubles, difficulties, issues that each one of us needs help with. And we're looking, how do we solve this? Would you continue this week to lead us and guide us and draw us to learn more about you? Because we want to be able to say, it is well with my soul. And that means trusting you more and waiting. Believing that at the right time, there will be a reward for us, whether it's on this side or the other. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for always drawing us to yourself, for your long suffering with us, for your unfailing love. You are great and greatly to be praised. Your greatness no one can fathom. 
So we say tonight, we love you. Draw us to yourself. Speak to us through your word, please, so that it will be well this week with our souls. And we pray for it in Jesus' name. Amen. See you in a week.